So for the lower model, we're gonna block it out in the same fashion as we did for the upper cast. The only difference is for this model, because we're gonna be using a wax spacer relief, we're not going to apply that fine layer of wax as I did for this one. We're still gonna block out the visible undercuts, but then we're gonna do something a little more, a little different. Okay, so once again, I'm going to use my number seven spatula. I got my font stock, I got that. And apply wax to the visible undercuts just as we did for the upper cast. Now having nice control of your wax means that you don't have to go back and carve things excessively. And I'm gonna trim it. Notice that my wax, the block out of the wax is beyond the outline, and that's okay. You don't have to stay to the line. You can go beyond the line. And once again, rotate your model in a way that you control the flow of the wax as you're heating it and applying it so it doesn't run all over the place. heat up your instrument a little bit and go back and carve some of the excess. Very simple. Now, because we're using the wax spacer on the lower, my block out doesn't have to be as much as I did on the upper. I could be a little bit thinner. Because I'm gonna use a wax spacer, that wax spacer gives me a lot of forgiveness. But certainly, you need to block out the visible undercuts. Those were very minor undercuts. The big undercut is in here. So if you place your font stock vertical in relation to the base of the cast, you can see how much block out you have there how much of an undercut you need to block out. Quite a bit, and same thing on the other side. You can certainly use your number seven spatula to apply wax like I did in these areas, but that's gonna take a long time. You can certainly use your font stock to get some wax from your Bunsen burner and apply it to this area, but that's gonna get very messy. So what I like to do is take a little bit of utility wax, roll it up, squish it together. So now I got a little wax bowl, or ball, I should say. And I'm going to pinch it into position. And that took very little time and it's very clean. I'm gonna heat up my instrument, again using the tip of my number seven spatula and carve it as previously. And I'll burnish the wax in a little bit with the back of the number seven. So that happened very quickly.
So I'll show you the before and after. So we went from that to that in about 30 seconds. But more important, it was effective. Just carve a little bit more so we don't have excess block out. So now you see a vertical wall of block out right there. We need to block that out. So I'm gonna do the other side. Take a little bit of utility wax, roll it into a little ball, something like that. Pinch it together. No, I'm fine. And once again, pinch it up against the area that you're trying to block out. And then go back and carve it. Notice for this one, you don't need to apply any heat to your number seven spatula because the properties of this wax are a lot softer. This wax has a lot softer physical properties than base plate wax. So I can just carve it without applying any heat to my instrument. Obviously, I've obscured a lot of the outline that I had before. And that area now becomes a bit of a, of a guesstimation where we're gonna cut it back. But I think as we work through it, you'll realize it's not that, not that difficult. Okay. So, up until now, we've done almost exactly the same that we did on the maxillary cast. I blocked out my visible undercuts. Yes, I did. I used um, a different type of wax to block out the retromylohyoid space, but everything else is exactly the same. The only difference now becomes of using a wax spacer versus the fine film of wax that we've applied over the whole maxillary cast. So we're gonna do it a little bit different. And because we're doing it different, the method of how this custom tray versus this custom tray with a wax spacer is gonna be a little bit different how it's used in the clinic for final impressions, certainly for the border molding. So I have a full sheet of base plate wax here. I don't need all this wax. So I'm just gonna divide this wax into two halves, pinch it together. I just need half a sheet. So very gently you're going to apply heat over your Bunsen burner. And we are going to adapt this wax and cut it back to the line. It's important not to melt the wax as you're doing it over the Bunsen burner as I'm doing it now, but create a soft, a uniform soft um, consistency of the wax. So you have to flip the wax back and forth over the Bunsen burner and rotate it and make sure that the corners of the wax as well as the center of the wax are equally heated, warm enough so you get that consistency. You can see a little bit of, of blanching of the wax as you heat it up. So now, very quickly, I'm gonna start on the inside. And pinch the wax all the way down to the vestibules. 
and I'm gonna pinch the wax all the way to the buckle extensions and labial extensions here too. Now, as you, do, as you come here, the wax will wanna fold, so if it does, just kinda of thin it out with your finger. But it's very important not to thin the wax, so use the broad portions of your finger, not the tip of your finger, because you might pinch through it, to create that uniform thickness as you're pressing the wax down. I might have thinned it out a little bit over the richer molar pad here. I can certainly go back and add, add a little bit of wax with my number seven or my font stock. So before I cut it back, I'm going to assess it. And I think right here, I'm a little bit wide, kind of fold it against itself, or I guess I did it. And I'm going to add some here over the retromolar pad, because I think I just pinched it a little bit heavy, or maybe the wax was a little bit too soft in that area, and as I was applying pressure, it thinned out on me. So. But that's the beauty of wax, you can go back and manipulate it and change it. So before I cut it back, once again, I'm gonna utilize my alcohol torch to smooth out the wax, get rid of the fingerprints, this guy away and make everything nice and smooth so now we're gonna take our surgical knife and cut this wax right to the line and again, the importance of having a heavy outline and cutting it back right to the line. Just like before, I'm holding the model, but my right side now that comes in to cut the wax, I'm anchored to my left side, whether it's using your last finger or your third or, or fourth finger. And I'm gonna hold it in a way, and this is very important, that you cut the wax at right angles to the surface of the cast. What does that mean? So I'm gonna cut a little section here and I'll show you guys. So I'll peel this section out. Notice that the wax is cut at right angles to the surface of the cast. So my blade approached this angle. I didn't go in too steep or too shallow. I am right angle, so if I'm gonna use this model surface for a second, just to prove a point, if I'm cutting to this surface, I'm right angles to the surface. I'm not angled one way or another. So I'm gonna continue that throughout And again, it really doesn't make a difference where you start and where you finish. I'm gonna cut out the inside, holding the blade at right angles to the surface of the cast. And I'll pull this out. If you have room in your wax cup, you can utilize this wax, don't waste it. If the wax lifts, just go back and readapt it with an instrument. And again, I'm, as I'm working through, my blade, once again, it's basically 
held in the same position and it's my left hand that does all the work here really. I'm rotating the model to accommodate the blade position. So back here, this is a bit of a guesstimation on my part where I think the custom tray is in relation to that line. But I think I'm fairly close. Finish off the other side. Right side is anchored to the left. My left side is rotating and it creates a nice precision cut. Some of the utility wax, you might have to go back and clean it off here. But the important, is, the important thing here is, is that we get a nice sharp ledge from our cuts. So rotate your cast that you can see that line and follow that line as much as you can so we don't change the length of this tray. Now it's a little difficult to see through all this block out here at the interior portion, but I have a pretty good idea where the outline was and I can vaguely see it through. So I don't think I'm that far off. Just go back and clean off a little bit of the flash of wax that that's caused through the blade because of the blade. Now and I used a fresh blade, which allowed me to cut through the wax with very little resistance and created a nice sharp ledge. Try to use a fresh blade when you're doing this. Don't use the font stock, it's just never sharp enough and it's too wide and it's just gonna displace your wax away from your lines and it makes it very difficult to create an accurate finish. So I'm going to give it a gentle flame here with my alcohol torch. And that is the wax spacer versus the thin layer of wax that we introduced on the upper. And the final step into producing a custom tray, or at least a block out for the custom tray, when using a wax spacer, is we need to incorporate what we call tissue stops. The tissue stops will maintain the space that we're creating in wax in the patient's mouth. And the way we do that is we take our surgical blade and we're gonna create four tissue stops. One just before the incline here, which is just before the richer molar pads, usually around the six area. So what I'm going to do is make a little slot here. And you see now the importance of the outline of the crest of the ridge. I'm gonna make that opening, which is about a five by five millimeter opening. I'm gonna make that opening over the crest of the ridge to ensure that it creates stability of the tray while we're working through the border molding at the next clinical appointment. So I'm gonna do one on each side. You wanna go back as far as you can without cutting or establishing this tissue stop 
on the incline portion here. So I'm just before the incline. I want to spread these tissue stops as far as I can. And I'm going to do two more. One around the three or somewhere between the three and four area, between the canine and the first bicuspid. Pull that out. Make sure you make your tissue stops broad enough because if they're not wide enough, what's going to end up happening, you're going to create a pressure point when you're working with a patient and it's not going to be very comfortable for them. So make sure you create a, a bigger footprint, so to speak, almost like a snowshoe effect. So it's a little more comfortable for the client and it reorients the custom tray back in the same position every time you do a border molding section as you're working around the tray. So this same technique could certainly be used for the upper as well, no different. Which one I like to use? It all depends on the scenario, but most likely this one, because this gives you more space for your impression material, which will create a mucostatic type of finish for the impressions and not displaced tissue, especially if you're working with clients with a lot of soft tissue, mobile tissue.